it's a great pleasure to have a chance to talk to Martin Daunton. Uh, Martin, I always ask by, or start by asking when and where you were born. I was born in 1949 in South Wales, born in Cardiff. Uh, my parents had married the, the, the year before and they were living rather curiously in the middle of the city on a farm <laughs> uh, because the in, in Cardiff there's a, a, the river goes through the city centre and there's the, uh, the state of the Marquis of Butte which will become important for my later academic career and on one side of the castle grounds and the other side big parkland running up to Llandaff Cathedral and my mother's cousin farmed that land and uh, so I was brought up initially on that farm right in the middle of the of the city centre before mo moving so out. A rural upbringing. <coughs> a, a rural upbringing in the city. Urbe, as they uh, used to say. Quite right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, lovely. I mean I was thinking it's Daunton is not exactly a, what I imagine a Welsh name should be so can you tell me something about your family and where it comes from on both sides if you as yes. far back as you like, the Norman Conquest if you want. Well, I can't go that far back because as a, a historian I find my, the, the life of my own family uninteresting except in the, the extent to which it illustrates more general phenomena. So I've mm. never been particularly interested in my family as, as the family. Um, <clears throat> but my grandparents on my father's side moved from near Bristol to Cardiff in the late 19th century when the coal trade was booming and Cardiff was the most rapidly growing city in, in Britain, town as it then was in Britain. So there's a huge wave of people across the Bristol Channel to work in the coal mines. But my father's father moved over to work in the shipping industry and he was a, a ship, shipping uh, company clerk as far as I, I'm aware at, at the beginning of his career. And then uh, Sometime around about 1900, he joined the Labour Party. Um, was one of the founder members of the of the Labour Party in the city, and then went to work for the Cooperative Movement. <coughs> and I mean, he died in, in the 1930s. But uh, there there was that very l strong link when I was growing up between uh, my father's family and what was you know, still the co the Cooperative Movement. <coughs> Uh, my father went to work for the Cooperative Bank and um, he became a bank manager but was always in that curious situation of being in a very you know, good middle class job but always seeing himself as part of the labour movement. Mm. Uh, so there was always that interesting um, tension I think about what one's social position was and um, his brother, uh, his elder brother uh, ran the the transport fleet for the for the company. So again, he was running the 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 fleet, but was uh, trained as a mechanic. So sort of this blurred line between working class, middle class. Mm. Taunton uh, is that a it's a no name or something? Do you no, know? it's um, well, it's like in Taunton. Oh, I see. Yeah. It's uh, it's quite a common. Place name. There are various places around here: Staunton and uh, oh, Norton yeah. and Taunton. I don't know what what it what oh. it means. So oh. on, anyway, on my father's side, they were uh, West Country Anglicans mm. moving into South Wales. Mm. On my mother's side, uh, if you went back two generations, they were Welsh speaking and coming from the Vale of Glamorgan. The, the family lived near Llanfwrd Major. Um, in the Vale of Glamorgan and uh, had been Welsh speaking I suppose in the middle of the 19th century uh, I'd lost all of that by the time I was growing up uh, but very much still the, the Calvinistic Methodist and of course in South Wales this uh, tension between the chapel and the church mm -hmm. uh, was still quite strong when I, when I was born in 1949 and we went to live in a village outside Cardiff where there was the church which was very much you know, the Anglican establishment, the, the local landowner, the, um, the Jenner family and then the Nonconformist chapel and there were two sort of different societies, it wasn't anything like Northern Ireland of course but it was still very much the, 
the alien Anglican exploiters, you know, the tithe war and all that sort of thing. So I suppose when I was growing up, I uh, sort of just imbibed the sense of the, the different cultures and political identities, mm. uh, which I then became fascinated in in a more um, academic, intellectual way. Mm, that's very interesting. So the Anglicanism of your father's side and the mm. chapel of your mother's side. Yes, although my mother became an Anglican and sort of mm. became more Anglican than what the Archbishop. Name? What was that uh, well, family name? Well, you just mentioned uh, Daunton possibly being a Huguenot name, but uh, my mother's maiden name was Bellet, B-E-L-L-E-T-T. Mm. And I've never quite understood where that name came from. Uh, I was once in Paris in the the conciergerie where the some of the um, people were held before being beheaded in the French Revolution and I noticed mm. on the on the plaque a family called Bellet B W L E W T. so I thought well perhaps perhaps who knows <laughs> they were uh, really uh, sort of French aristocrats fleeing but I, I rather <laughs> rather doubt it mm. um, but I, I don't know where that name name came from mm. your comment about uh, being a historian precluded you from a great interest in the particulars of our family because you, insofar as there were general themes mm. solves the problem I had with Gareth Stedman Jones because when I asked him about his ancestors he was not really at all interested in them and I don't yeah. think I was particularly yeah. I think yeah. professional historians in a way are averse to the antiquarian studies of their own families I think that, that I think that's right I'm just interested in the family insofar as they elucidate some more general themes and might, I suppose, as I get older, think about how experience I imbibed unthinkingly mm. might have helped me adopt an attitude to what sort of historical questions there might, there might mm. be worth asking. Mm. Uh, going back to the, the Marquis of Butte, um, who owned the, the estate, well, well that's the whole town of Cardiff in the South Wales coalfield, I mean, 1868, the second Marquis became a Catholic. It's a subject of Disraeli's novel, Lothair, and built this sort of fantasy medieval castle in Cardiff. And at Castle Koch, sort of lived in this dream world uh, designed by William Burgess. And I could see out of my bedroom window the, the turrets of Castle Koch, which look a little bit like uh, Villa Le Duc re redone in South Wales mm. and of course realising later on that it's one reason why I'm interested in the way in which uh, Victorian Britain used memories of the past and understood the medieval period and made me very averse to the sort of historical interpretation you get from certain American historians which say Britain was lost in some sort of nostalgia for the medieval past, this made them anti-industrial and in fact, you see the greatest coal owner in South Wales, one of the most hard-hearted, ruthless capitalists, mm. also being uh, this medieval fantasist. Mm. And I think that growing up in that society made one a little bit more aware of some of the contradictions and tensions and ambivalences mm. of Victorian culture. Very interesting. <coughs> you had a brother or sisters? Or? Uh, one, one of each. I'm, mm. the, I'm the eldest. Mm. Uh, my sister was born two years after me and she continues to live in South Wales mm. and in fact she became a teacher in, in Tiger Bay mm. in Cardiff, the old, the old dock area, uh, you know, special needs teaching largely for uh, Somali mm. families. I mean, this is one of the oldest immigrant areas in the country alongside Liverpool, you know, the, the, mm. the, the, uh, the workers in the shipping industry. Um, and then I have a brother who's 10 years younger than me, who now lives in the States, mm. um, and he's, he's a scientist. How do you think your parents' personalities, apart from their religious backgrounds, uh, affected you in what ways? Which is mm. an indirect way of saying what were your parents like. <laughs> that's, um, that's interesting. They, they, they were not themselves highly educated in the sense of going to university. Um, but they had a feeling that they had not achieved what they might have achieved. Uh, so my father passed 11 plus and went to the uh, grammar school in Cardiff in Canton, uh, but left because his father died and he went, went to work when he must have been 
14 and 15 I suppose uh, to support his widowed mother um, and then when joined the army in 1939 um, and obviously enjoyed his time in the army because it opened up horizons I think he enjoyed it because he never s fired a shot in anger and I don't think he ever saw the enemy he spent the time in uh, Palestine and um, Egypt which gave him a sort of education in you know, Egyptian archaeology or um, the, the, the politics of the Middle East which he always remained interested in so he had a naturally inquiring mind um, when he came back from the from the war he went went to work in the bank and he, he worked his way up in the bank and remained very interested in matters about um, you know, economics uh, politics <clears throat> so he would talk about about that but he never himself been to university so I think to a very large extent he was living vicariously through the success that I had and always very much backed that and didn't want me to have the sort of job that he'd had and said no you've got to do these other, these other things these are things which are more of like um, academic, intellectual or, or, or whatever um, on my mother's side um, her father also passed the 11 plus before the first world war and went to actually the same grammar school as my father a lot, a lot earlier and he joined up in the army in 1914 under age and he died about two years after I was born so I never never knew him but from what I understand, because he, because he never talked about the war to my mm -hmm. mother, uh, the war must have been a terrible experience. I mean, he was on the the front near Ypres throughout the war. Um, would never talk about it, and when he came back, the photographs of him showing that he was a man who looked twenty years older than his chronological age, and he went to uh, work. Um, in farming so he actually worked with the the cousin who owned the farm or ran the farm in the city centre owned a farm overlooking Cardiff on the hill again rented from the Butte estate and had um, cows and delivered milk so he then it was not very well um, and my mother had left school quite quite early and went to work in a clerical clerical job. Again, I think there was a feeling there that, again, one had been one's development had been stopped by personal circumstances, by if I did fallout from the war, by by the depression of the 1930s, which of course was so bad in South Wales, um, about sacrificing ambition and that meant that there was this huge sense of wanting the children to to do very well so I think that there was a huge expectation my parents that the children would succeed academically uh, one of my first memories um, <coughs> was sitting on the beach in on the Gower Peninsula it must have been about 1962 and my parents say no you're going to go to university, aren't you? We'll back you uh, if you want to do that. And that, that's what they always did. Actually, quite late for a first memory. You were 14 at the time. Well, OK. Um, <laughs> no, well, perhaps I, I, I exaggerate. A, a, a first memory of a, of a whole conversation, if, oh, if right, you like. Yeah. And a, a significant memory mm. where one's talking about one's mm. future. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, not a, no, I mm. correct myself. What not was a, your first memory? Oh, gosh. First memory? The coronation, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you were four, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you, you were fond of your parents. They, they were good parents, as far as you they were. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because people often skirt around that fact. Well, it, it's 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 interesting because I, I I suppose it's true of all parents. They were both they were annoying in some some respects, mm. but immensely supportive in others. Mm. Um, I remember when my father died and um, there was a service in the in the church in the village and the uh, the clergyman who gave the speech said oh uh, Ron my father he was always so proud of his children 
and of course that can be embarrassing to children yeah. um, but on the other hand it's, uh, it gave one the basis for which one could develop mm. okay well let's take you to school now yes. um, where did you go first to school your primary school not, not kindergarten, we'll skip that. No, well, we didn't have kindergarten yeah. in South Wales, I can assure you. Uh, my parents moved from uh, Cardiff in, it must have been 52 or 53, which is why I'm a little bit vague about that, because my, my first memory, I think, was this, of, of the coronation seeing it in Cardiff. I um, don't know why I can think that because we must have moved around about that time to, to Wenvo, which is a village outside Cardiff. And uh, so the, the village was still rather curiously like a rural village in, in England. It was owned by, by a family, by the Jenner family. And they owned the village pub, which is immediately across the road from our house. The De Jenner family still had their younger son as the rector. Um, they had the reading room, the estate uh, workshops. <coughs> uh, they, they had sold the Wenvo Castle, which is now the golf club, but they, one of the members of the family ran a farm. And they built the school, which is a Church of England school, which was just down the road from where um, my parents lived, or we lived. So I went to that school, which was at that stage still a three classroom school and the expectation had been that most of the children were from the local um, in fact, agricultural labourers, the, the workers on the estates or the, the workers on the farms, but there were now some middle class incomers. Uh, so I was there um, and somebody who was a good friend at that time was the son of a consultant at the University Hospital in Cardiff and there was very little sense there of providing um, you know, a thumb of education there's no, none of this current obsession with tests and metrics and, and so on uh, the, first, the first year class was very traditional I think the, the teacher was about to retire one learned to read and write in a very old-fashioned way. Uh, the classroom was heated with a cold fire, so it was freezing cold if you were sitting at the back of the class. Uh, it hadn't been modernised since it was built in the late 19th century. And then went to the, the second form, third form. Then the fourth form was taught by the head teacher, whose main claim to fame was that he had been uh, an umpire or referee, whatever the right word is, in in boxing mm -hmm. uh, for the Commonwealth Games of 1958 uh, when I when I was there. Um, but he was clearly suffering from I now can't think what it might have been diabetes or alcoholism or something. He was often used to disappear. You'd go out for to play in the morning, and he would he'd forget to bring you back in. So it was a sort of a lack of education, really. One was sort of self-educated until the 11 plus came along when only those pupils whose parents wanted their children to pass 11 plus would arrange evening classes with him. So this meant that some of the very able pupils from less well-off backgrounds would just fall by the wayside. So it was a very curious sort of of um, education, which then, of course, after I left in 1960, was was changed and professionalised. Um, but I remember that I think three of us passed the 11 plus from our year. The the son of the um, the consultant, the medic, the son of a lorry driver from the local council estate, <coughs> and myself. The son of the lorry driver. His parents did not allow him to go to the grammar school, but uh, insisted that he went to the secondary modern school, if like the second tier school. And that sort of brought home to me how parental um, ambition and family background is was so... Was there a fee or important. something? No, no, no it was school uniform. Oh. Um, but, but also, I suppose, a sense of it's not for the likes of us. I, mm. I don't know. I always found it very puzzling because mm. he was a very clever... Mm. 
person. <clears throat> and I sometimes wonder what might have mm. happened to his life if he had gone to the grammar school, mm. gone to university. <clears throat> he might have done very well, I don't, I don't know. Mm. Um, but anyway, that was, that was the, the, prim the primary school um, in, in the village. So you passed and you went on. You then went on to the famous Barry Grammar School. Indeed. Um, tell us, tell me about it, and I may have questions about it. Well, well Barry Grammar School is a very curious um, phenomenon of a, a grammar school in a small, rather depressed town in South Wales, which seemed to be punching above its weight in terms of producing academics and historians in particular. Um, I mean, Barry is the, is the other side of, of Cardiff, going, going to the west. It was a, um, a port that was built just to export coal um, in the late 1880s, early 1890s. So Cardiff had the port, the, the, coal, the uh, coal export port, but also all of the other, um, the offices, the, um, the banks, the, the service sector. Barry was merely a place where you exported coal. Uh, it was a town of about 40,000 people. So it didn't have the wide professional middle class that you would have in, in Cardiff. But Wenfer was outside the city limits of Cardiff, was in uh, Glamorganshire. So we went that way for education, although for all other things, for the sort of culture and shopping and whatever, it was always looking towards Cardiff. So I went to, went to Barry. Barry Grammar School was set up as the county grammar school in the late 19th century, but well, it must have been set up under the 1902 Education Act, and it had a very famous head teacher um, who wanted to make sure that it was academically very good. And when I went there, there was a headmaster, Leslie Matthews, who was very traditional, very rigid, and I think universally disliked by the pupils and I suspect the teachers. <coughs> uh, he was a very rigid, unimaginative sort of person. But of course made sure the place was run well with a lot of discipline. The person we all liked was the deputy headmaster, uh, Tyvian Phillips. And Tyvian had gone to the school, I suppose in the late 40s, as the history master. So when we started doing O-level history with, with Tyvian, one had this sense of the intellectual tradition of the cult. Did it be into school. Oxford? Or no, no. Well, Tyvin is, is an interesting, interesting case because he was brought up in the Swansea Valleys, uh, coal mining valley behind Swansea, where his father had been working in the pits and was killed. And he walked down the hill to Swansea University. So he went to the local university. Um, remained very much the local South Walian, Welsh-speaking, um, Tyvian, you know, suggests the, um, the Welshness of his family upbringing. And he remained very much part of that world from which he, he'd grown up. He was um, the chairman of the local Labour Party. Um, he was very much involved in local politics. Um, avid reader, the new statesman. Uh, I'll talk about that later on, perhaps. Um, he was he was married and didn't have any children, and he clearly uh, wanted to support the pu his, the, the, his able pupils to to do to do well. And of course, one of his first pupils was Sir Keith Thomas. What about Habakkuk, wasn't it? Habakkuk was at the school before that, of course. Mm. Um, so when I was at school... So he was there before this teacher was there? He was there before this teacher was there. I mean, Habakkuk was there in the 30s. Mm. Must be yeah. early 30s. Because yeah, be. I think he became an academic in Cambridge. Was he at Pembroke in 36 mm. or so, something like that? Um, so, as I say, this is the, this is the memory, the, mm. or, the oral tradition of the school. Mm one somehow learnt about it, not quite sure how, that uh, at the time I was at school, the Professor of Economic History at Oxford mm. was from the school, Sir John Habakkuk, mm. later Vice-Chancellor. Professor of Economic History at Cambridge was from the school, David mm. Jostin. 
one of the, my predecessors in my job, um, said Sir Keith Thomas mm. uh, had been taught by uh, Tyvian. So when we were doing A-level history, we were given off prints mm. of Keith's latest um, <laughs> articles. So you said you had a sense you were in a tradition. Mm. Uh, Glyn Daniel, the mm. um, archaeologist, was from the school, and well, there were a lot of other. Um, other academics, some of whom, of course, were in, in Swansea University. So there were very strong intellectual uh, links with, with Swansea. Uh, we used to go down there for, for lectures and, and, and so on. And a um, man there, his name has suddenly gone from my, mm. my head, um, an old boy of the school who went to Swansea as a lecturer, then came back to Barry as the Labour Party candidate selected by mm. Tyvian. Mm. So it's this very strong sort of sense of the the political life of the place, and that history and politics were interconnected. Mm. So Tyvin had his uh, this, his pupils he thought were going to do well, and he would have them into his study. He went on to become the headmaster, and you would meet on Monday morning, and he would give us his uh, old copy of the New New Statesman. Oh, you would talk about recent articles in past and present. So you were getting a sort of tutorial that you would get, or a supervision that you would get at Oxford or Cambridge. Were there just two or three of you? Or there were, no I remember, course. three of us. Hmm. Um, and I've lost, completely lost touch with the, the other two, um, both of whom went went on to... And, to and you'd be set an essay and you'd read it to him? Or? No, no, you just talk, mm. discuss issues. Mm. Um, I remember talking about the scientific revolution, for example, mm. which was, we were doing uh, 16th, 17th century history. And for some bizarre reason, he was a great admirer of Geoffrey Elton's work on Thomas Cromwell which was just coming out at that time on the Tudor Revolution of Government. And I remember thinking, I don't believe Geoffrey Alton's Tudor Revolution of Government. So I remember having discussions there about uh, the Tudor Revolution of Government. Mm. And I was taking the, the non-Eltonian line mm. as, as a rather sort of um, precocious 16-year-old. Um, mm. um, and that was a really good form of education and the school was also connected with the arts, which I think is another very important point. Um, one of the other pupils of Tyvian was Robert Tier, mm. the, the, the singer. Honorary Fellow of King's College. Honorary Fellow of King's College. He was a choral scholar here, I think. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it was at that time that Robert Tier was uh, singing in some of the, the Britain premiers. Mm. So you had that connection. And one of the teachers in Spanish, uh, Gwyn Thomas, mm. was a novelist who also had, must have been halfway through my time at the school, two plays on in the West End in London, and was appearing on the Tonight programme. If anybody <laughs> remembers the Tonight programme, other than people of, of our age, which was on television at about, what, 6.30, 7 o'clock, mm. with Cliff Mitchellmore, yeah. sort of mm. current affairs type programme. And Gwyn Thomas would appear on that, talking about art, politics, Wales, which he made this rather mystical, mysterious, comical, Dylan Thomas-y type of, type of place. Uh, again, son of a, of a miner um, in, in the Welsh Valleys. And I never quite worked out whether he taught Spanish because he fought in the Spanish Civil War, but that was what I like to think that, <laughs> that, that, that he did. So although this was a very curious, sort of miserable place, it did have these wider connections. So you never thought that you were cut off from the wider intellectual things in, in, in British society or, or wider European society for that matter. Um, <clears throat> and I also think it's, it was very good for becoming a historian because one wasn't taught English history or rather British history as if it's English history mm. because you taught English history as if it's something other and one looked at it through a Welsh lens so if we were talking about 
the Tudors, of course they were Welsh originally, but then you're talking about the Council of the Marches and the imposition of a different form of governance upon a society which is different. So it immediately gave one a, a slightly off-centred view of, of history. Uh, it made, so it makes it more easy to understand if like English rule or British rule in India having been brought up in that sort of environment. Colony. We were one of the first colonies, yes. <laughs> um, and I think the, the other person who had a huge influence on me at school was the English teacher. Uh, God, I can't remember his first name now, Mr John, mm. um, with whom I kept in touch until he died a few years ago. In fact, I kept in touch with Tybee until he died a few years ago. We did a A level history with him, sorry, A level English with him. And the first year, we didn't look at a single t set text. He would come in one morning and say, uh, Okay, this week I want you to go away and write a short story in the style of. He would give you a list of people. Um, and I remember going off to write a short story in the style of William Faulkner. And then another week it was uh, Nabokov, um, or you would write a poem. And it, was, it didn't say why he was doing this, and we didn't question why he was doing it. <clears throat> One might often did it, because what he was doing was making you aware of different styles and different ways of articulating ideas. In the second in the second year of the sixth form, he he went off to become a teacher at the local um, education college, teachers training college. We had a, a teacher from Oxford who rigidly went through the set texts. Hated it. He was so boring. <laughs> uh, whereas with with um, Alan Alan John, uh, I can still remember his lessons. Uh, one of them was I remember analysing a new song by Bob Dylan. Um, so I can still remember that, but remembering, um, you know, Milton Paradise Lost Book One, um, no. And it made me think what what a good teacher is. It's a good teacher is somebody who makes you think outside the uh, syllabus, makes you think outside what you need to know to pass an exam. Uh, we were not spoon-fed into in, in, into that. It was these these other other things. Fascinating. Um, were you interested in other things at school? I mean, games, music, debating, politics, as um, well as not culture? games. No, <laughs> certainly not not games. The the two other boys I remember going to these special lessons with uh, with Tybian, um we all disliked sport intensely and we were allowed to do cross-country running and the running being in inverted commas I think which meant that we jogged slowly down the road from school around the corner and sat in a field <laughs> and uh, and talked uh, there was a fourth um, fourth boy uh, who went on to become a consultant urologist so there was a sci mm. scientist as well um, so not not sport uh, to my shame, I never went to the Cardiff Arms Park. Um, and this was the, the heyday of the Welsh rugby teams, being all conquering. So I ne never did that. The thing which really uh, so excited me at the time and still does is opera, because this was the time when the Welsh National Opera was really starting, and I'd never really thought that I was interested in opera and I still remember one day going home on the bus from Barry with somebody who lived in the village who said oh <clears throat> I'm going to the opera tonight with my parents sort of he wasn't terribly excited about it and I said oh you poor thing and then he phoned up and said my brother um, can't come and there's a spare seat would you like to come I thought well, why not and it was in a box in the new theatre in Cardiff, which is a tiny, intimate theatre. And it was the Magic Figaro. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. And so ever since that, that experience, um, 
you know, that's that's what I've been passionate about. And well, the British National Opera Company in those days was extremely good, and there were some world-class singers who came from South Wales, who were giving performances to to help them. And one of the most important was Gawain Evans, yes. you know, major singer at uh, at uh, Covent Garden. I remember seeing him there in uh, Falstaff and Stuart Burroughs, then a young up and coming singer, uh, Margaret Price, and there was one particular performance of the Magic Flute. But all of these famous singers came along and um, performed together. I mean, it was a, a world class in this tiny, tiny theatre. Uh, but there were also some other operas coming on about that time where the Welsh with the Scots were putting on Janacek, sort of rediscovering Janacek. And I remember going to Yanufa. <coughs> thought that was absolutely phenomenal. Um, it remains one of my favourite operas. So yes, opera. But Carter was also very good for music, generally, because there was the BBC Orchestra of Wales. Uh, the university had a very good music school run by Alan Hoddenot who was a composer, a terribly distinguished composer, but a composer. And he had in various better composers, more famous composers than him. I remember going to a concert given by Olivier Messiaen and Yvonne Lorio. Um, and there were string recitals, string quartet recitals by the best quartet of the University of Wales. And um, my parents were, were very interested in music. Uh, that's that's what they they liked doing. So my mother from the nineteen thirties had gone to what was I think called the Carl Rosa Opera Company. Uh, so I played modestly, um, and my father's sister married a very good musician who played the organ in Llandaff Cathedral. So there was a sense of that they were all interested in in music. Um, and, and went, my parents right up to death, went to a lot of these concerts in, in South Wales. Yes, yeah, so opera, music, and politics. So how could one not be interested in politics in, in South Wales at that time? It was almost a one-party state, except for one constituency, uh, which was not Labour, which was Barry, which had become Labour in the... 1945 election um, and then lost in 1950 election I think it was rather than 51 and the it was actually a woman who held the, the seat and she was still very much about and was a friend of my head teacher uh, and then in 1964 election I remember my father took me to hear Harold Wilson um, big, big speech and the MP Oh, not MP, the Labour Party candidate in 64 for the constituency was uh, David Marquand. And I went to um, David Marquand's um, hustings in the village. And I remember that was the first time I asked a question at, mm. a, at a political rally. So I think growing up in, in um, that school, you were either going to become a professor of economic history or a Labour Party MP. Are we used to joke about that. Now, which one of us is going to become the editor of the statesman, <laughs> which one will become the academic? Um, I don't think any of us became Labour MPs, but um, uh, I think quite a few did, did become academics. Coming just back for, to music for a moment, some people find uh, music somehow filters into their work. Um, they either listen to music before they write or when they're working or or inspired by it in some way, or, and others can't bear to have a sound of music anywhere near them mm. when they're working and so on. Has it, does it affect you in any way? <coughs> I've changed very much in that respect. When I was doing my PhD thesis, I would always be listening to music, and very often uh, 19th century opera, so you know, writing to the sound of, uh, you know, of Otello or Falstaff or, or whatever. Uh, now I can't do that. And I just wonder why it is. Is it because the music is more important and therefore wants to give one's whole attention to it? Is it because writing becomes harder as one gets older? 
um, and I need to concentrate on that. I don't know, but I, I now compartmentalise it. Okay. I think my musical taste has changed since mm. since those days. When I was younger, I'd be listening. To, I would listen to a lot of opera whilst working. Whereas now, I tend not to play opera on you know, um, a, a system at, at home. I want to keep the opera for the performance. Mm. So I'm much more listening now to chamber music. And I just wonder if that's a general sign of becoming older, more introverted. I don't. I don't know. Uh, more reflective. Mm. Uh, but if I if I were to be listening to something whilst I'm reading you know, to, to get through the tedium of perhaps reading another draft of a thesis I've read three times before <laughs> uh, then I would listen to something like piano music particularly Debussy or um, Fauré or uh, something something like that more um, introverted or um, less, less sort of in your face, if you like, mm. more inward. The other thing which uh, often happens around 15, 16 is some kind of religious event, either just a prosaic confirmation or sometimes a questioning of how you've been brought up within a religion. Mm. And with your chapel ch- uh, church background, I wondered what happened to you. Well, Sadly, very little, uh, or perhaps uh, comfortingly ve- very little. Uh, when I was growing up, my father was the treasurer of the parochial church council for, for a long a long time. Uh, and I was an uh, altar boy in the parish church and knew the, the rector very well, who um, was an interesting man, went to Cardiff University, read classics. Uh, so again, part of the the intellectual um, interests. I used to talk talk with him about various issues, not not politics, but more philo- philosophical issues. Um, he was a very very nice man. Sadly, very ill with angina at that stage, and and, and died. When I went to university, I was still a sort of attending um, Anglican, uh, so for some time went to the. Uh, the chapel chaplaincy there at Nottingham uh, and then just drifted away. There was no sudden uh, conversion or no sudden uh, being sort of born again. It was just a a drift uh, away. Um, I suppose now there's been a drift back in the sense it is very comforting to go to Evensong in a Cambridge college to listen to the music and have a time for um, reflection. That doesn't necessarily mean that one believes everything one hears, uh, but sometimes the sermons in a Cambridge college can be philosophically interesting. And being a head of a Cambridge college, sitting next to the preacher after dinner on a Sunday night is quite entertaining because I can ask questions about what I've heard in the sermon without being you know, too critical and pushing because that wouldn't be appropriate if somebody is in the college as a guest one can have quite interesting conversations and I think as a historian one needs to understand the religious dimension of the past I think that quite a few of my colleagues in economic history don't do that mm. and I think one, one should if I understand a 19th century businessman who might be a philanthropist one needs to try and understand the religious motivations that they that they have. So I continue to be intrigued by by religion in terms of what motivates people and how they live with contradictions. I mean, I, one of the first things I remember growing up in in Cardiff, going into the city centre, going to the National Museum of Wales, I was seeing a statue of a man called John Corey coal owner and philanthropist. I remember thinking at the age of I don't know, 13 or 14, how could you be, be a coal owner, in other words, a wicked exploiter of the poor, and a philanthropist? Uh, so how, how did those two come together? He was a Calvinistic Methodist, a temperance supporter. Um, so I started to be <coughs> intrigued about 
the different religious mm. um, experiences of people in the past. So, th so I continue to be interested in religion, perhaps more in a social anthropological sense than mm. uh, being necessarily a believer in any way. And you, uh, I think you mentioned in another interview, you, you were um, a reader of Keith Thomas's Religion and the Decline of Magic. And yes. Found it an interesting <coughs> book. Yes, I, um, yes, I read that when it first came out, I suppose. Um, what did it come out? About 71. 71. Yes, I graduated in 1970, so I couldn't remember if it was just before or just after I graduated. I'm not sure that Keith actually understands religion. <laughs> Remember, he'll be watching this. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> you better edit that one out. Mm. Um, he would probably say, "In what way do I not understand right, it?" Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember. No, I won't. I won't. I won't say that. No. Um, no, I think that's a, that's a very great book, and I I'm, mm. I much enjoyed it. You can leave. Mm. You can leave that in. <laughs> okay. Um, Right, well let's, let's um, after that very interesting interlude on the Great Barry, um, let's, that's Barry Grammar School, not some individual we half mentioned, but um, have a, yes, have a glass of water. Um, curiously, I think we both went to Nottingham University in different capacities in the same mm. year, and your account of Nottingham University compared to my very, very fragmentary one, is totally different. I can't remember where you were. Well, I was at the LSE, and I was asked by a professor of history who was a friend of Trevor Roper's to fill in for someone for a term on right. early European history. Right. I've forgotten who the man was at the moment. So I um, went up and gave seminars weekly. Mm and um, read the essays and, and regurgitated what I learnt as an undergraduate mm. at Oxford. And I don't remember anything particularly negative about it. I mean, they, they turned up, they read their essays. I treated it more or less as I had done. Mm. And the standards seemed to be roughly equivalent to what I'd seen mm. in Oxford. And yet your account is very, very negative about the teaching there. Well, let me gloss that yeah. in a way. Uh, there were two separate departments, mm. the Department of Economic History, which I was in, and the Department of History. Mm. And there was a two-year, like part one as we would call it in Cambridge, which was survey courses. And you had to do three subjects. So I did Economic History, History and Sociology. In Economic History there were weekly supervisions. Uh, in history, which after all was a third of the first two years, there was, my recollection, one supervision, a term, of about three quarters of an hour, something like that. And the feedback was fairly minimal. There was a group of you, and it wasn't just one person, it was... I think in history, to be fair, it was, it was one. Mm -hmm. I remember having uh, one f once with, um, I think I would go so far as to say, I only had two supervisions in two years. Mm. Uh, one was with uh, Michael Jones, mm. who was a very good historian, uh, and we talked about, I don't know, um, Burgundy, I think. Um, and the other one was with um, somebody who taught Michael Watts, who worked actually on um, 19th century religion. And I remember he said, I read, read my essay, he said, oh, well, clearly you were taught at school how to write essays. Uh, so jolly good, keep up the good work. That was, that was it. So there wasn't a sense of the intellectual exchange that I was used to at school. Some of the lecturing in history was really bad, very bad. And obviously not not yours. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> go. Lecture, didn't go to them. Yeah, um, <clears throat> but I remember the ones on nineteenth-century um, European history, where a young lecturer had come in, and we were down to, 
about three people in the room by, by the end. Actually nothing was done at all about mentoring, um, student feedback, um, so that was really frankly just disappointing. One felt there that in the history one was making no progress whatsoever from um, what had been taught at school. The economic history was a different was a different matter. Um, did a survey from the the Middle Ages through, and the first person I had was Jan Titov, who was a pupil of Michael Poston, mm. and it was almost as if you were hearing Michael Poston, <laughs> uh, of whom I was a great admirer. Um, so I found that really interesting talking about the Black Death or medieval field systems um, and going off to look at the medieval field system at Laxton. Um, but then some of the other teaching was not terribly, terribly good. The teaching of the sort of early modern period um, was lacklustre. Um, the teaching of the early 19th century was by somebody who was a violent opponent of Edward Thompson, which of course then made all of us become violent supporters <laughs> of Edward Thompson. And most of his lectures were summarising one book. So you would go along and you would have a lecture on, I still remember one of them, summarising Charlotte Erickson's book on the, the background of industrialists in the lace industry and the steel industry. I'd read the book. What was the point of just having it summarised for you? Uh, most of us felt it all, that was all completely un unnecessary. So it was, I wouldn't say that the first two years were intellectually exciting, apart from Jan Titov, until a young woman came, um, Helen Meller, I took her third year special subject and I've remained in touch with her ever, ever since. Um, in fact she wasn't much older than me when, when I think about it and um, we worked on some of the same sort of areas and, and she, she uh, reignited the spark which I don't think the first two years did. What, what was her subject? What was the special subject? She. Um, did a course on late 19th and early 20th century British social history, history of cities essentially, uh, which is what I went on to do my, well, my PhD. You wrote your first published article in that yeah. for Abrahams. Um, That's right. That. Mm. Yes. Uh, so she studied at Bristol with Bill Ashworth, mm -hmm. who uh, wrote a very interesting book about. Uh, the development of town planning and mm -hmm. ideas about what cities should, should be like. Um, I was very interested in, in, in that. Uh, in fact, one of my other interests uh, was always architecture. I, I mentioned growing up in, in Cardiff and being fascinated by the Burgess architecture, this mm -hmm. medieval architecture, which at that stage was deeply unfashionable. Mm -hmm. um, but I found that, that in, intriguing and of course looking at Welsh castles and um, the churches on, on the on the Welsh borders but I also then became very interested in modern architecture so after graduating I sort of half toyed with the idea of going into some sort of urbanism sort of work as, as I said I remained absolutely fascinated mm. uh, by but the the teaching was, was patchy, I think. Mm. The, and this was a time of the sort of the height of the importation of sociological and anthropological models into yes. history and of um, the sort of new social history in, in Ruskin College in Oxford. And, yes. Um, as you say, E.P. Thompson and Jim Dios mm. and all mm. these sorts of people. Mm. Did, didn't you get a, a sense of that excitement? Yes, because the third subject I did was sociology. Mm. So that's what I remember uh, most fondly, I think, was the, the courses in the history of sociological thought. Uh, so that was my first exposure to Max Weber, to Durkheim, <coughs> Herbert Spencer, 
um, John Peel, who was one of the lecturers there, was writing a book was about he? Spencer. Uh, so I can still remember that Compt. Because he was an anthropologist, as not he, as well? Yes, he was. Yes, but he was in the sociology department mm. there. Um, and a good lecturer, I think. Yeah. He was very good. Mm. He was excellent. And Julius Gould. Yeah. You remember Julius Gould? Yeah. Uh, so we, we did, it was a two-year course, and we did a sort of, like a run-through of the, the great names mm. in, in, in sociology. Um, including Marx. So I was always very interested in taking some of those ideas and applying to the history. Mm. But in the, in the economic history department, that wasn't done. I thought that was an interesting lack of, of connection there. But it was also interesting that one didn't either study formal economic theory Mm. Um, now that was perhaps unfortunate because the professor was um, A.W. Coates mm. who was a very eminent I say he is, I think he's still alive very eminent historian of economic thought but he was on leave the critical mm. year when I could have taken the course on the history of economic mm. thought mm. and I much regret that mm. uh, because I, that's something I, I became subsequently very interested in because I don't like to study the economy by applying formal economic models to it, um, like you know econometric historians do. Uh, I prefer to study the economy in terms of how the people at the time thought the economy was functioning. You know, so how did Alfred Marshall think that industrial cities and industrial districts were functioning? What was the mindset, go back to religion, what were the cultural interpretations of the economy at the time? I suspect that some of that comes from reading the the uh, the, the sociology or the social anthropology. Hmm. I now see why you mentioned Spencer because you know he's not as well. Later on, he wasn't as well known as Durkheim and Weber no. and courses <coughs> with John Peel. There, hmm. that that makes sense. What else were you doing? Again, were you uh, apart from listening to opera? Were you? <laughs> engaged in student politics or drama or anything? Um, not, not, in, not in drama, uh, other than the fact that at Nottingham, at that stage, Nottingham Playhouse was one of the best rep companies in the country, directed by John Neville. So, brilliant acting. Um, John Miller was directing. So we remember going to the School for Scandal, directed by Jonathan Miller, which shows, if you like, the seedy side of Bath society rather than the sort of move the elegance showing people urinating in the sideboard in, um, <laughs> so he showed this so that that was very 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 good um, there was also the the Nottingham Film Theatre in the lace market and they had two two programs a week changing on Wednesday uh, so uh, myself and some friends most weeks went to the two new films that were coming out and this is the time of you know, Pasolini and Bertolucci and um, Fellini and um, uh, Bergman. Um, so I remember seeing most of those films at that, that time, Buñuel. Um, so it was cinema, the, uh, the theatre. Uh, there was not so much music there. There was a um, um, rather indifferent um, orchestra which didn't do very much, occasionally went to those. Uh, but there was a good music school, uh, so there's quite a bit of music within, within the university, chamber music, so did that. And then politics, of course, this was the time of the student mm. um, results. Mm. I went up in 67, and the events of 1968 arrived in Nottingham in 1969. <laughs> um, one of the former students of economic history went off to Warwick to work with Edward Thompson and he was a, a Trotskyite and he wanted to take you know, socialism to the shop floor in the car plants of, uh, of Warwick, sort of thing which Edward Thompson wrote about in Warwick University Limited and he came back to, to Nottingham and um, made some impassioned speeches about academic freedom and liberty and at that time there was a professor of French who reputedly phoned up a university in France about a student who was going there on a placement and said, don't take this person, um, he's um, some sort of Marxist. 
and the secretary or member staff in the department was somewhat outraged by this and it became public. Then there was a cry around the, the university, open the files, open the <laughs> files, what, are, what secrets are in the files? Um, and as a result of that um, um, agitation, the um, registry was occupied and I slept in <laughs> the floor and I remember we watched Bunuel movies of course and um, the professor of French was then suspended on full salary without any duties. So I remember thinking subsequently that's, that was a good, <laughs> a good outcome for him. Um, and then in early 1970 there was a second sit-in. I can't remember what the issue was, was over now. Uh, it seemed very important at the time I'm sure. Um, the demands were about student representation on university committees, which I believed in you know, very passionately at that time. <clears throat> a few years later, thinking that, that was all very adolescent and very silly, and what was all that about? Looking back on it now, I think it exactly that was what was needed because there was no student voice. Mm. I talked about some of the poor teaching, there was no student representation. Mm. Um, I think now, sitting as you know, chairing um, university committees or governing body committees in college, the student voice is very often the most intelligent mm. uh, and sensible voice. Um, and so I thought that in the end it was the, it was the right, thing, right thing to do. Talking about politics mm. and sit-ins and things, is there anything else you want to say on that or should we... No, I don't think so. I just remember the Labour Club mm. there. Um, it made interesting. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Did you find as Master of Trinity Hall that having students involved in uh, governing body and other committees is helpful? And yes, I do. Mm. Yes. In fact, I think one of the really good things about the college is how um, the, the academic staff and the students get on very well together and debate issues in, in an open way and the students on the whole are sensible and mature mm. um, and keep us well keep us on our toes and thinking through about what other things should we be doing they're very active in issues like access going out to schools trying to encourage people from less advantaged backgrounds to come to university they push it on things like should we be a fair trade college should we be a green college um, so they, they stimulate debate and keep us in touch with, with issues over you know, um, gay rights or you know, religious issues uh, about should we have kosher staircases and should we have the grace said in Latin in a Trinitarian formula. So they're always asking questions in a very intelligent way and making us think. And one of the things that struck me about Cambridge, and it's different from my experience of many cultures, is that older people tend to listen to younger people. I mean, that at meetings, junior research fellows and new members of the college, if they say sensible things, people don't use hierarchy to crush them. Yeah. And that's rather unusual. As you know, in France, for example, it's a very democratic yeah. yeah. academic system. Yes, I think that's one of the good things about the, the order of precedence in colleges. If you come in as a senior professor from outside, you are the same standard as the most junior, junior fellow in terms of pouring the coffee. It doesn't allow you to stand on your dignity. Mm. Uh, so I think, yes, it's a very egalitarian sort of um, environment. And that's a medieval inheritance, of course. Of course. The Benedictines and so on yes. use that principle. Mm. Yes, very interesting. Okay, well, when you finished at Nottingham, um, what did you do then? I went on to the University of Kent, and the reason I went to Kent is that Helen Mellor, my, my teacher in my third year, recommended Theo Barker as a supervisor. Theo Barker had examined her PhD thesis, and she enjoyed the experience, and so far as one enjoys being examined. <laughs> And I went to see Theo, who um, had been professor at the, or reader at the LSE, 
before going on to be the founding professor of economic history at the University of Kent. I met him at the LSC. I got on well with him. Uh, his wife was an opera singer uh, who actually sang in some of those Janicek operas that I, that I mentioned. She sang with Scottish opera. Uh, he was a very gregarious, ebullient sort of character. Again, like Tyrion Phillips, didn't have any children and again liked to encourage younger people. Um, he was always um, you know, willing to take you out for dinner or for a drink. So his supervisions were mainly going out for dinner. He was a bon viveur. Yes. Um, he was a friend of Jim Dyer's, and who I got to know. And Jim Dyer's examined my PhD thesis. So I went to the University of Kent, which had only opened a few years earlier. It had some very good um, young economic historians they were not much older than me. Uh, one of them, David Ormrod, I've kept in touch with ever since. He's actually coming up to Cambridge uh, to run a big research project. Um, it was a lively seminar culture. So it was, it was that stayed quite a good place to be. Although Theo then became rather disillusioned with it. That it wasn't living up to the sort of almost utopian ideals that he had. <coughs> and he went back to the LSC become professor at, at the LSC, um, where we later on came together to, to run a research seminar. Um, so Kent was interesting at that time, uh, although I did my PhD on South Wales, which is not the most obvious mm. uh, place to be working on South Wales, but that worked out very well because Theo had done his PhD on Lancashire again on the, the emergence of industrial culture, uh, particularly on the emergence of St Helens as a major industrial town. And I was doing the same with, with South Wales, the development of the coal export trade, the shipping industry, the, um, the building of a city, sort of thing that Jim Dyer did on Camberwell. So I was trying to pull together the sort of things which I'd learned with Helen Mellor in Nottingham, the sort of things which Theo had done on Lancashire uh, in terms of the Industrial Revolution, the emergence of an industrial society. So that, that worked out pretty well, I think. And Theo was a bit like Tyvian Phillips, my history teacher, somebody who just gave you, the conf gave you confidence and encouraged. I can't think of anything he ever said to me which was intellectually exciting. <laughs> Um, but that didn't we really, that wasn't the point, I don't mm. think. Uh, he made one think that one's own ideas were intellectually exciting, and he would give them every support and encouragement. Was there a research seminar? Yes, there was. Yes. Was that good? It was good, yes. It was um, every other week, mm. um, followed by dinner. Mm. It's a very much on the, the model which Theo used to have up at the LSC. Uh, that that was good. Um, visiting speakers would come in. Um, yeah, that was. It, it, it was rather like I'm accustomed to now in in Cambridge. Hmm. Were there any others, uh, any of your contemporaries who have continued um, as historians or academics that you keep in touch with? Either it, no, it's, not it's, anymore. <laughs> it, it's, it's very interesting that the people I've kept in touch with, this, this sounds a terrible uh, condemnation of myself, were not the, my fellow students, but the young academics. As I said, the, at, at Nottingham, Helen Mellor was her first job, just mm. out of her PhD. So I suppose I was 21 and she was probably 24. And at... Um, Kent, David Ormrod must have been about the same age. Mm. Uh, so those are the people I've kept in touch with. It perhaps inevitably because I then became an academic myself at the age of 24. Mm. And there wasn't that much gap between us. And they were people who had similar interests because they were all interested in music and art and sort of things I was interested in. 
whereas this this sounds a terrible thing to say I remember at one of the seminars in Kent going along to the seminar and I was reading a, a novel by I can't remember who it was, no French novelist and one of the other research students said why are you reading a novel? That's a waste of your time, why aren't you getting on the PhD? I said well, well because one reads novels it's, you know, it's, <laughs> that's what one what one does so uh, I thought that was that was interesting. Mm. It was perhaps also because as a research student I was spending a lot of time in the archives up in London mm. or in South Wales or in Aberystwyth so that I wasn't in, in Kent that much actually. So I didn't get to know many of the other graduate students. How, how did you work? I mean, I was very influenced by both Keith Thomas and Brian Harrison who were great, kind of one fact, one card type of people. Yep. And uh, later computers and things like this. Mm. Did you develop any particular research methods as a research student which you kept on with? or? Mm. Well, I was never a one card, one fact mm. person. I, I did start writing things down on cards, mm. but I abandoned that almost immediately. Um, my first piece of historical writing was on my undergraduate dissertation, which was on the Dow Life Sign Company, which had been the world's biggest iron company in the late 18th, 19th century. And when I did the research on that, um, it was a letter box. Um, I transcribed or transcribed or summarised uh, letters on cards and then sort of shuffled the cards mm. around the particular themes to write the dissertation. That was actually my first published article in the Welsh History Review. Um, when I started on the PhD, because in those days you went straight from undergraduate mm. to PhD without the Masters, I don't think we were actually taught or told what the best way of keeping notes was. And I did it by um, just summarising, annotating on sheets of paper, A4 paper, in files according to the, the source material. So I worked on the Butte mm. archive and kept the notes from that. And then when I then started to write a chapter or an article, I would revisit those files according to the question I had in my mind. And if I was retranscribing it in rough order in terms of the, you know, the, the, the themes or the parts of the argument. Mm. And I would initially do that by writing it. This is before computers write it. That would give me a rough shape, a digest of material from all these different files. And then I would sit down with a manual typewriter and then do another version of it as more connected prose. And then I would mark that up, edit it heavily with pen and then I would retype it as a finished article. I think that's more or less how I've continued to. I was wondering whether that's what you still do. Hmm. Not using the computer until towards the end. Well, I think I would now largely do the that initial transcribe, not transcribe, the, the sorting bit now yeah. on a computer. Hmm. So I wouldn't do that all longhand. But I get a very crude draft by going back to the notes questions I got in mind, taking the material out, putting it into rough order, um, then redoing it, typing it up, marking it very heavily uh, with a pen, it has to be a fountain pen, and then typing it again. Now because of now computers I might then do that three, four, five mm. times yeah. rather than the once. Why does it have to be a fountain pen? Magic. <laughs> Sorry? Magic? Magic, it's probably magic. No, it's, I don't know, there's something comforting about the solidity of a fountain pen. Um, the legibility of the handwriting as well. <laughs> um, I don't know. Mm. Where, I mean, since we're on to the question of writing, where and how do you work? I mean, in the mornings or 
uh, in your garden or in in a study at a desk and a chair? How? Well, things have changed as I've got older because of other responsibilities. But what I always used to do, my first job at um, at Durham and then in London, is write at home, not in the office. I find it almost impossible to write in the, in the office. It has to be also a different psychological space. And then my normal routine would be to start writing at about nine o'clock after reading the newspaper and work for two hours break, read a novel, go in the garden, then work another two hours to lunchtime, stop uh, for How can you fit in four hours with a break in the garden? Well, that is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Just shows that my, my arithmetic is not very good. Uh, I, might, I might go from 11.30 to 1.30. Uh, right. uh, stop for uh, lunch and make it an hour for lunch. Mm. That's again, I might go in the garden, read the paper, read a novel, um, and then do the same in the afternoon, and then possibly do something after dinner. So what I always used to do with writing was do that for three days intensively. When I first came to Cambridge, we had a house on the coast in Suffolk, and my routine in the summer was to go there on Tuesday evening, write solidly Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. My wife would come over fri sun on Friday evening and then I would do some writing at the weekend, but go for a long walk in the country, go down to the coast. Um, think about issues whilst going for a walk. Because mm. I've always... You talk about the issues? Some, with your wife? Sometimes. Sometimes mm. one has to be a bit careful about um, not being too boring about mm. about it, but yes, um, mm. I, I would normally when I sit down to write, I've normally worked out in my head what the argument is. Uh, so I do a, a lot of thinking whilst doing the other things, mulling mulling it over. Uh, so that's what I say. That's what I used to do in. I first came to Cambridge. I was doing the same in, in London because I taught at University College London and we had a house in Islington and there one didn't go into the office except when one was teaching. So I would, particularly in the summer, spend most of the time at, at home writing. And that was the same routine. Now I find it very difficult because being the head of a college and having a university administrative job it's almost impossible to get a solid day. So the writing is very much in snatches, which is, which is much more difficult. Mm. And it's picking up material, thinking, oh, where was I? Let's try and get back into that. And then that's, that's an hour gone. Mm. And then you might have another hour before the next committee or visitor. Mm. Mm. So that's probably much more difficult. But you're retiring from the headship of mastership anyway. I retired from the from the college, uh, but not from the university. Mm -hmm. So I have the administrative job in the university as head of School of Humanities mm -hmm. and Social Sciences. Mm -hmm. But I think what that will do is free up more weekends and evenings, mm -hmm. because a lot of the college events are evenings and weekends. So you, you enjoy writing when you can do it, or do you find it a strain, or both? Both. Both. Mm -hmm. um, I find writing a book a strain. I sometimes really think, why am I doing this? Why, am I, why should I beat myself up like this? If I'm writing a lecture, I find that very easy. And I've been mulling over why, why that is. I'm trying to write a book at the moment. And I had a meeting with my publisher um, earlier this week, and he had the synopsis. It's a very which, ambitious book, isn't it? Very, well, foolhardy. <laughs> um, I had the synopsis, which is 50 pages of typescript, and I read it before meeting him. I thought, well, this is actually quite 
well written. It's, you know, it has a pace to it. It's, it's putting over the story. Then I looked at the typescript of the book. I thought, this is dull. This is overly detailed. This is turgid. Why, why don't I write it like that? And it's this problem about becoming captured by the archival material, which I've lovingly collected in archives uh, in this country and in the States. And I want to put in every bit of it. <laughs> and I, of course, I always say to my students, don't do that. Mm. Um, so I've got to try and get the tone of voice of the synopsis or the, the lecture, which is written in a much more conversational tone, back into the book. And what Maitland did, which was brilliant, he used to stand as a lectern and speak his writing. And as he spoke it, he wrote it down. Yes, I think that's uh, very good. Very good advice. And I remember Jim Dios saying to me when he examined my PhD thesis that he always read everything he wrote out aloud to his mm. to his wife, mm. conversationally. Mm. Um, yes, I think that's it's getting that that tone of voice, which raises the question which you talk about in the other interview about who we as historians are addressing. Mm. Um, I mean, you referred to a number of people who've won important academic prizes, and you referred to television people like Neil Ferguson and, mm. and so on. I mean, who who do you think you are addressing now, particularly in this new book? Well, the new book is to be, I suppose, the person who might pick up the Economist or the Financial Times, mm. somebody who's not a historian, but is thinking about what is the nature of the world economy, the political economy, uh, that we're facing yeah, at the moment. Don't remind me what, it, what it's about. What's the, the working title of the book is, and the phrase is taken from John Maynard Keynes, uh, <laughs> The Economic Governance of the World, since 1933, which is, um, as I said, a rather foolhardy topic. Uh, so it starts with the, the World Economic Conference of 1933, which is an attempt to address the, the problems of the slump, of the Great Depression, uh, which failed. And then it goes through, of course, the setting up of the, the wartime post-war institutions, some of which succeed and some of which fail. So the World Bank, the IMF, succeed in a way. They're set up, they, they operate. Whereas the World Trade Organization, or was then called the International Trade Organization, didn't succeed. You had the interim body of uh, GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. So I'm looking at how does one design institutions? Uh, what is the process by which they set agenda? What is the voting system within them? Who has voice? Who doesn't have voice? How do they become deadlocked? How do they avoid deadlock? what voices are excluded. So one reason the International Trade Organization doesn't work is that the, it initially tried to incorporate the voices of the less developed countries and that alienated the American domestic opinion. So the organization fails and they're then excluded from GATT. How do they then get the voice back in uh, through other bodies? like Bandung and UNCTAD. Um, and that, of course, then leads through to today, where we now again have um, an international organisation, the World Trade Organisation, which is trying to incorporate all of these voices, but hasn't actually produced an outcome. So I'm trying to consider what makes some international institutions work, some fail, um, how are they structured, what views about distributive justice in the world economy um, are in the ascendant at any one time, uh, trying to in fact, destabilise the, the notions of the, the neoliberal um, economics, the Washington Consensus, by bringing in other voices. But that's more or less what, what, it's, uh, mm, what it's about. Certainly is ambitious. Yes, foolhardy. <laughs> <laughs> um, where do you expect, or do you ever have those, I mean, in the popular parlance, eureka moments, in other words, moments where things which weren't connected are suddenly connected, or you suddenly see a path through a great difficulty. 
There are many, I, I remember a few of these either extending over a few seconds or a few, a day or two. And I remember where they happened. Does this happen to you? Or? No, I think it's more sort of dogged determination, mm. nagging away at something. Perhaps I'm not asking big, big enough questions to have a eure eureka moment. Um, I tend to start with a more finite question. So, and they're very often triggered by things I see around me. So if I go back to my first job in, in Durham, it was at the time of, it was 1973, time of the miners' strikes, and I'd been in South Wales as well, just finishing off the PhD. So I moved from one area to the other during the miners' strikes of 73, 74, was it? I'm thinking, well, why is it that the, the miners in the northeast of England are so moderate, um, conservative with a little c, whereas the South Wales miners are incredibly militant? Now, so I guess sort of nag, nagging away at, at that. So a historical question triggered by comparing those, those two areas. And if there was a eureka moment, it was thinking, well, this might be something to do with generational conflict and the way the um, workplace was organised underground. So I started to think then about the, the family structures and the generational mobility systems within the, the two areas and why that might have led to different forms of outcome. So I'm not sure if it's a eureka moment, mm. but it was connecting things which I hadn't ever previously put together in my mind, if that mm. makes mm. sense. Mm. If someone asked you to choose a couple of your pieces of work which you were most happy with and would like to be remembered by, um, oh dear. What, what would you, what gave you most satisfaction, what do you think? Well, and why? I'm not, I'm not typically satisfied with anything. Mm. Um, as soon as I write something, I probably think, mm, I wish I hadn't done it that way. Okay, so starting off on that, mm. that, that basis, I think we all feel that, as if we had known what we knew at the end of the process, we would have started somewhere else. Um, I think the thing which uh, has been uh, most read and um, insofar as has any influence has had influence is the work on taxation, which seems like a very tedious subject, but which has come back today. And the question was why are some tax systems legitimate and accepted by the taxpayers without tax revolt, whereas others are not? And it's got nothing to do with the, well, not a lot to do, with the level of taxation as a percentage of GNP. It's to do with many other things. And that is of, ve is of current relevance because of the debate over the the 90% rule and this um, argument of uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff, which is that if you go above a 90% debt to GDP ratio, then economic growth will fall by 1%, which of course has been taken up by the Republicans mm. in, the, in, the, in America. And it's much quoted by George Osborne in this country to justify austerity. Mm. Historically, it is flawed. Well, there are many periods when it's, the national debt's been much higher, isn't it? Of course, yes, like during the British Industrial Revolution. Mm, exactly. So one then needs to, to think about why in certain periods does a high debt to GDP ratio lead to growth? Why at some points is the high level of debt politicised, mm. whereas in other periods it's not politicised? Mm. So the work that I did on the impact of the Napoleonic Wars 
and of the First World War, the Second World War, when debt GDP ratios go above 200%, uh, I think is something I'm, I'm most pleased about. Because at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, obviously you have a huge resistance to the level of debt. And it's what the Chartists and so on, the radicals are arguing about. And how does how did the government negotiate around those tensions? At the end of the sec uh, end of the First World War, in Britain there was uh, some resistance to the level of debt. And the the Daily Mail sort of um, anti waste campaign, uh, but you didn't end up with serious problems of Germany and France or Italy of debt revolt or tax revolt. So, so understanding what it was about the nature of the British state and the British fiscal system which allowed that to be negotiated and a high level of um, debt and taxation to be established in the interwar period so that when Britain entered the depression it already had a reasonably good welfare system uh, it, I think is, a, is, is an important question. Whereas America entered the depression without a high level of taxation because Andrew Mellon slashed taxes in the 20s. So trying to work out what leads to a legitimate tax system, accepted tax system, securing taxpayer consent, I think is one piece that I'm mm. just uh, pleased about. I would like to follow up. In, in retirement, one book I want to write is about the system of taxation within the British Empire, because the same sort of issues occur in India and Africa, and helps to establish the sort of states you have there now. Um, and I've been involved with some colleagues in Japan working on the Shug Commission to Japan after the First World War, and what sort of tax state should be created there. So that, that's that's one area. Um, so the work I did on housing, mm. uh, I was also quite pleased about. Although, so I, I would do that slightly differently now, and I might go back to it, because um, I started writing about housing at the time that uh, Mrs. Thatcher was privatising council housing, and the question came to my mind: Why did we have council housing in the first place? And lots of the assumptions of the on the Labour Party were you know, that was a natural thing to have, but was it? And so I try to understand why, around about the First World War, we moved from a system which everybody expected to have, which was private sector rental housing, with the emergence of uh, socialised housing in terms of housing associations, and for that matter, welfare systems based upon. Uh, autonomous bodies run by workers to a highly collectivized centralized system so I try to understand why something which was unexpected if we were to take a standpoint in 1900 came to pass now the only problem with writing about that was that I discovered that the final chapter of my book was then copied by the Minister of Housing and sent around to justify the privatisation of council housing, <laughs> uh, which is not exactly what I was expecting. Because nowadays, with council housing have all been sold off and the return of private rental sector, um, yeah, I think that I need to write, rewrite that book and take it, take it forward to another stage. So I think a lot of what I'm most pleased about are historical arguments which still have been current resonance. Mm. Uh, I think that's partly because when I started out reading economic history I was never quite sure if I wanted to become a historian or a political scientist. So I've always worked rather on the interface between those things so that even when I'm writing if I, if I pure history just for the sake of the history I'm interested in how policy is made in the past. Why do some ideas have resonance and not elsewhere? How how do state structures shape the ability to, to, to have different forms of policy or different taxation? So I think those, perhaps those two. Take two on desert island. Um, 
when you went to Durham, mm. um, I think you made the comment that some senior figures there, or maybe just one or two, were rather discouraging of young folks. Yes. Publishing too quickly and mm. um, maturing in the wood, I think was the expression or something to like that. Put yes. it away and let it. Um, yes. And I think that led you to reflections about why many of our colleagues actually don't perform as well as you would expect them to do later on in mm. their lives. I wondered whether you had any further thoughts on that. Yeah, I went to Durham in 73. Again, there were two separate departments, history and economic history which I think is a very um, unhealthy divide. Um, and in the history department, the, the head of the history department was a man called Hilary Seaton Offler, a very um, intriguing man, whose father had, so it was claimed, been a German bandsman um, <laughs> in, in Britain. Um, and he was an expert on um, William of Ockham. And he'd edited volume one of the works and he published it and everybody was waiting for volume two. And the only other thing he published was a contribution to the short history of Switzerland. And it, was, it was thought that when he died um, there would be a drawer full of works and there was, there was nothing. And whenever somebody in the department um, of history wrote something he would say why publish it, put it in the drawer leave it there, it'll, it'll mature. <laughs> so there was this feeling of no rush to publish, a sort of gentlemanly scholar sort of um, argument. And the number of people in the history department who actually published was, uh, was, was very low. Um, very intelligent people, no expectation of publishing. In the economic history department where, where I was, there were some very good people, um, Richard Britnell, medievalist. I knew him, yes. Uh, but when I was there, he hadn't published very much. I left in 79. Um, since since mm. then, there's been a flood of very important books. Um, but he wasn't allowed to teach medieval history. The head of the department, Frank Spooner, wanted to teach courses which were by theme. Mm. So land, labour, Mm. Um, enterprise um, and I did cities all places everywhere mm. um, so Richard had to do land uh, agriculture but wasn't for some reason I don't know why allowed to do the Middle Ages <laughs> so he taught 18th century Scotland <laughs> which is here was the closest he could get to the Middle Ages. So I'm, I'm not sure how much he was joking on that. I was when Frank Spooner retired, he, he was then able to link his research and his, his teaching. Uh, Duncan Bithell, who taught the labour part, wrote a very good book on the handloom weavers of the Industrial Revolution of Lancashire, where he came from. And then around the time I arrived, he wrote another book on sweated labour. He stopped writing. Uh, there was no sense of encouragement. Um, now with the RAE. Now with the RAE, it's the opposite problem. Mm. Mm. We're all encouraged to write our four outputs during the period, whether or not <laughs> we feel that we have anything to say, or perhaps we ought to be writing one big book rather than mm. four short articles. Um, but I arrived there in 73, and um, somebody else, uh, Ronald Mickey, arrived in 74. Um, and I think we've both written written a lot. Mm. And Randall's an expert on finance. He was brought in to be you know, like the finance man. And he's written a lot about the stock market in the city of London. Um, yeah, so the culture then changed. Mm. And by the first, was the first RAE, but one of the early RAEs, uh, the history department at Durham, which had merged the two departments, um, had one of the top gradings, five star. Mm. There was a sudden fundamental shift of the culture. All those articles are stored away in the <laughs> and nobody reads. <laughs> um, in the cupboard. Yeah. We're, we're approaching towards the end and there's two or three questions I still wanted to ask you. One, one was about Cambridge. Mm. Um, when did you first come here? Uh, 1997. 97. Mm. 
what struck you as when you knew, I mean you'd been here before and visited and you visited Oxford, but did anything about the system here appall or delight you in particular? I think the right words are delight and intrigue, <laughs> not, not appall. Um, I was teaching at University College London, I'd been there from 79 to 97, and I thought I would stay there until I retired. I you know, loved living in London uh, as a city, and uh, University College London I think is an amazing place. There was a problem though about what I was teaching. Um, I was trying to teach economic history within this wider historical, cultural, political thought sort of framework. And we had a course on 20th century British history and I would do that and I had a colleague who taught the political history. But he wouldn't, in supervisions, deal with the other part. He said, I'm not interested in that at all. I said, well, how can you possibly not be interested in that? You're an expert on the First World War. Didn't that actually have an economic element to it? So I'm making it sound <laughs> rather aggressive because we were good friends. I don't, I don't mean that at all. Um, it was very difficult to do the sort of intellectual work that I was interested in. Cambridge is, is fundamentally different. Uh, because all students have to do a course in economic history in the history faculty. Uh, so what I was interested in became integral to uh, the, the teaching of undergraduates. And there's a large group of us um, interested in the same thing and having the same sort of approach. Uh, not looking at, the, um, at economic history through clear metrics which is what happened at the LSE or Warwick, but looking at the economy as a cultural construct. So in coming to Cambridge, I immediately felt intellectually liberated by having colleagues who have the same sort of mindset. I suppose looking at it the other way, that's why I was appointed, because I had the same sort of mindset <laughs> as they had. But it was a, it was a match. Mm. Um, I, was, I then... After, sometime after I after I arrived, I put on a special subject, which is the basis of this um, book I'm trying to write. And some of the students on that were just stunning. Uh, this is on the political economy of uh, the world from 1939 to 73, if like the creation and the demise of the Bretton Woods regime. And some of those students are just astonishing. Um, some of them went on to do PhDs, there's one of them working on the Financial Times, uh, there's one of them in the Treasury. Um, you know, these are people who have been at work. Do you pleasure. think the students were better or you were just lucky? Mm -hmm. the students were different. They, mm. they were, I wouldn't say better. Mm. Students at UCL were really very good. Mm. Um, but some of the students I've had in Cambridge have been interested in the sort of thing that I've been doing because mm. of the intellectual uh, background that they mm. have from the type of history degree we teach. I suppose the thing which I found most curious about Cambridge was the method of teaching. So if I were to say I was shocked by anything, it was this. Part one history, two year degree, the emphasis upon one to one supervision which I think is good in the first year when students are learning how to write essays and how to argue. But they didn't have seminars in which they learned to debate amongst themselves, which is what we had in London. And then in the third year in London, the special subjects, which are on the detailed archival work, were capped at an upper limit of, I think it was 18. So again, you could, you could debate. In Cambridge, I was quite shocked to find that some special subjects had 80 students in, which their teacher would then have to split up into two groups of 40. Now you can't really have a debate amongst the students with that size of a group. So I felt there was a, uh, a mismatch between where the emphasis on the teaching was. Now, my own special subject, um, in fact the most I ever had in my special subject was 18. Mm and 18 very bright students in a room I didn't have to teach I would just go in and say uh, okay 
today we're looking at this, th these, these particular documents and these speeches of Richard Nixon, and off they go. And uh, my, my role was to nudge and steer. Mm. Uh, perhaps they'll come and say, well, I don't, know, I don't think that's quite right. Uh, but I found that really stimulating and um, most, the best teaching I've ever had. What about the other curious, another curious feature of Cambridge and Oxford, uh, the college system? I mean, you mm. ended up as a master of, in a very distinguished college in a very distinguished tradition. One of my greatest heroes was your predecessor, Sir Henry Main. Mm. Um, do you approve of the college system? Well, how <laughs> could I not? <laughs> and why is it good? Right. Well, I never thought I would end up in Cambridge, never having been to Cambridge. I never thought I would end up as the master of a Cambridge college, being a relatively recent comer to, to the city, to the university. I suppose one thing I, I had found disappointing about university college is that one came in to do one's teaching, one ate one's sandwiches over one's computer. There was virtually no uh, common room. Uh, one never got to meet people in the science departments or even in, say, the economics department, except occasionally on the committee. Now, when I came to uh, Churchill College, where I was first a fellow, I remember one day sitting next to an economist and we were talking about uh, why levels of public spending vary in different societies over time. And I came up with a, with an idea off the top of my head. I said, well, I think it's like this. It's a U shape that the if you have a very limited franchise, you might have high public spending. And if you then widen it, then it might become less likely to be high public spending. And then if you get a universal franchise, it might go up again. So you're right, we can test that. So we got an ESRC grant and um, with an econometrician in the economics department here, and this, this colleague went over to Birmingham as a professor. We tested this and found in fact there was this mm. relationship and that the, 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 the uh, bottom of the trough was uh, 60%. If 60% of the people have the vote, you'll have low public spending. When it goes above 60, you'll have higher. If it's below 60, you'll have higher. <laughs> so, okay, I, it's a, that's a fairly sort of sim simple um, model which we enjoyed um, testing. But it was having that, that conversation and also having conversations with people in sociology, science, whatever. Um, it's that exchange of ideas in a way which is free and easy because you're not in a formal seminar setting. So you can do it in a relaxed way, a jocular way with a glass of wine and you can think about issues. Um, and of course sometimes you're talking about politics or music or opera or um, the latest novels and it's just um, endlessly stimulating. Yes, well, I like that. What about the and the students get the same out of it? I think mm. that's that's one of the great things about being the head of a college, um, which is that one gets to know the students, invite them into the lodge, uh, talking to them about what excites them, um, and they tell me what I should be reading, or which films I should go to. Um, so I, I pick up what the twenty-year-olds are doing, and I can then. I say what you know, what the sixty-four-year-olds are doing, <laughs> and I I find that ready-made community and exchange of ideas just so stimulating, and that's what it's all about. And it gives the students confidence, and it keeps me young. I hope. <laughs> um, and you like the pattern? I mean, I found when I went to the LSE from Oxford, one of the things which particularly came into focus when I left the LSE and came to Cambridge was that the LSE seemed. People called their rooms their offices, and they came in, and they taught, yes. I went. and then they went away. There was not much happening in the no, evenings. That's right. Among the obviously among the faculty, or even mm. in relation between the faculty, and I mean it was much more. There was much more of this obviously in Edwardian Cambridge yes. than there is now. Mm. But at least it wasn't a, a nine to five. I mean five to seven is a very important time in Cambridge because it's often the seminars. That's right. And then dinner, and then talking after dinner. 
because right. you live in the place where you work, you don't have to commute back. That's right. Yes, I think that's what we have to keep. And of course, as it's Cambridge becoming bigger and house prices higher, it becomes mm. becomes more difficult. Um, yes, that's something that I found very, very much changed one's working habits because more readings are not. Mm. We're entertaining in the college or out with other with other people, which is good. I suppose the thing we we initially found rather difficult is, of course, living in London. You go home. We lived in Islington, and you got to know people who lived in the same area as you, who are not academics. Mm. So our neighbours were medics, journalists, um, lawyers, um, a banker who became a furniture maker. Um, so one wasn't in a, in a bubble of a university. Mm. So I think that's something we initially found curious in Cambridge. How coming into Cambridge. Um, in 1997, without having been here, finding it difficult to get to know people who lived in the community mm. rather than in the university. Mm. I think we we finally broken through in well, that. You, in Little Wilbraham, do you have bankers and medics and other people as friends? Uh, well, uh, our next door neighbour um, is a professor of medicine. Yeah. <laughs> so it's also famous for its. Um, Strange religious denominations, I believe, the Wilbrahams, but maybe it really? I'll tell you about that after. Okay, well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's very interesting. I, I'm intrigued by that. No, we have got to know people who live, live in, in the village. Um, it's a very sociable village. Mm -hmm. um, so, the last two weekends have been garden parties in pe different people's houses. So, you know, we've got to know uh, some people who are retired business people from Acon Computers, uh, a farmer. Um, there's there's um, an alumnus who lives in the village who's the big landowner in the village um, there's the hole in the wall pub which is oh, actually yes. run by Trinity Hall alumni really? um, I've been there many times yes so yeah we have got to know to know people people there it, it, um, inevitably of course there's a lot of um, academics and mm. medics from Brooks. We're just about at the end, but um, two last questions. One is um, about your family, and um, it's always difficult to pry into people's married lives, but you're married, presumably. That's right. And um, does your wife, I don't know her name, obviously, um, is she, you mentioned you didn't want to bore her with your conversations about taxation systems, but do you discuss ideas? Does she, does she have a separate job in life, or how does it work? Yes, yeah, so uh, we, we met at University College, mm -hmm. uh, where she was working on the Bentham Project. Oh, yes. Uh, so she read history in London at Bedford College, mm -hmm. uh, when that was still you know, a separate college that later mm -hmm. on merged into Royal Holloway. Um, and she was taught by some of the people that um, I worked with later on, like Michael Thompson, FML Tom Thompson. Uh, so we, we knew people within the same circle. Um, but anyway, she was working on the Bentham Project, and I was a young young lecturer, and we our paths just sort of crossed fleetingly for a few years. And then she left and went to work in Brussels for the European Commission, setting up the the archive, to going around different DGs, saying where do you keep your archive, mm. what storage system do you have, um, and finding all sorts of um, interesting answers. Um, most of which fitted with the sort of national stereotypes that you might expect that the Germans had wonderful archives and the Italians were busy seeing sh shredding things. <laughs> um, so I went out just, just for the weekend and said, why don't you come up for the weekend? And um, well, we actually got, got married very, very soon after, after that. And then um, she could have stayed with the European Union with, with the archive, mm. which was set up in Florence. Uh, but came back to London and she worked then freelance setting up archives for the Royal College Obstetricians and Gynecologists at the London Hospital and in fact the archive of Bedford College and Royal Holloway which mm. is one of the great archives of women's education mm. and was then offered a job of going into um, hospital administration at London Hospital uh, which, which she did and then she went off to the Institute of Psychiatry, Bethlehem, and um, the Bordesley Hospital, uh, partly looking after the archive, because of course 
the Bethlehem is what 800 years old mm. uh, the art collection and writing the writing uh, in fact manuals for treatment of people with medical conditions mental mel- mental illnesses to explain to the patients what was happening to them so having somebody who could write who was not a uh, medic mm. so could explain things uh, and she could have stayed there doing that that um, that job uh, when I got the job in 97 in Cambridge mm. and I was told and I believed that I had to live within 20 miles of uh, the centre of Cambridge Ten. <laughs> 20 now 20 now flexibility come along. <laughs> um, so we decided to move to Cambridge and um, Claire joined the University Administration Mm, yeah. So she became the administrator of the Faculty of English. Mm. And then, um, after a certain period of time in that, she'd always had the ambition of doing a PhD, which she had started many, mm. many years ago at the, at the LSE. Um, in fact, she was also given a grant to work at the European University. And she resigned from the Faculty of English when. Well, I bet not, it would be unchivalrous to give the age, but she resigned and did a PhD, mm. uh, which she finished a few years ago, and is now uh, doing some teaching in the university, mm. uh, and giving lectures around the place, and um, writing and enjoying life. Mm. Well, I hope we'll have a chance to meet him. My yes. wife and I are very keen on archives of various kinds. Right. Um, I think we've more or less exhausted everything and exhausted you, <laughs> but if there was anything that you really would have liked me to have asked you about, one in, an important thing, I mean we've missed many important things in your life, but was there anything else that no, I think you you've really regret? Most of it. Regret? That regret. I didn't, didn't oh, ask you. I think, do I have any yeah. regrets? My God, I'm not regretting to uh, Edith Piaf. <laughs> um, no, it's no just I don't think so. Well, we'll stop there then, and thank you very much indeed, Martin.